Now, language is an endlessly fascinating thing, especially figurative language, use of various figures of speech. For example, try explaining to someone who's just starting to learn English what in the world we mean when we say it's raining cats and dogs out there. I used to ask people in West Virginia, will you be at church tonight? And some of them would say back to me, Lord willing and the crick don't rise. It took me quite a while to learn whether that was a yes or a no. My dad used to say all the time, for Pete's sake. And I never knew who Pete was. I've been told that something was a piece of cake when it clearly was not. People have accused me of having a screw loose. I've been asked to, to spill the beans when I would never do that intentionally. Some say it's wrong to put all your eggs in one basket but then they turn around and suggest that you need to walk on eggshells. And some people are trying awful hard to get their bucket list done right before they turn around and kick the bucket. I just don't think that's putting your best foot forward. And we've probably all said at one time or the other that we were just dying to do something right? I'm dying to, to try that new restaurant. I'm dying to get to the beach. I'm dying to hear the sermon this morning. Maybe, maybe not that one, but, but we understand that these are all figures of speech, uh, expressions that we use that are sort of worded in interesting ways to try and emphasize whatever the point is. And this happens uh, not only in our speech, but it happens quite a bit in a book like Revelation, which uh, we're currently studying from in this series, which we're calling the Seven Blessings of the Apocalypse. There are lots of powerful expressions, impressive images, puzzling figures of speech throughout this book. Have you ever said... I'm just dying to go to heaven. Now, perhaps. And you may have meant that uh, in the same figurative sense that we've been suggesting, but I want to suggest to you this morning that you can actually say that phrase and mean it quite literally. Oh, yes. I'm dying to go to heaven. Let's look at blessing number two this morning of the apocalypse. Last week was blessing number one from Revelation chapter one, verse three. Do you remember what it was? Blessed are those who read the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear and blessed are those who keep it. Well, blessing number two comes to us all the way over in chapter 14 of the Apocalypse or the Revelation of Jesus Christ, the last book of your Bible. And I'm going to begin by reading a little bit in that chapter with you. Uh, we're going to emphasize verses 12 and 13, but let's start to sort of get a flavor of all the figures uh, back in verse 6. John says, Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Another angel, a second, followed saying fallen fallen is babylon the great she who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality 
And another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest, day or night. These worshipers of the beast and its image and whoever receives the mark of its name. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors for their deeds follow them. These are the words of God. May he add his blessings to it. Now here's one of the great and indeed radical messages that we have to proclaim to the world around us. How blessed it is to die in the Lord. Blessed are those who die in the Lord. Our world is doing absolutely everything it can to keep from dying and failing miserably every single day. Here is an inviolable statistic. Now, I know a lot of people hate statistics, and one can certainly make numbers say anything, but here is a number, a statistic, that you can absolutely count on. Ready? One out of one dies. Scripture says it this way. It is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. That's in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. You cannot break that rule. You can't change it. It's a law that cannot be violated. And yet, nearly everybody is trying to do just that. Uh, I see it in a lot of ways. I see it in the insatiable desire of some to stay young. I see it in the crippling fear that many seem to have of sickness. Let me tell you something I've observed in my work as a gospel minister. Over and over I've seen this. I'll go to a funeral home sometimes and see a person or even a whole group of people that I can just tell you have spent their entire life avoiding going to a funeral home. You can just tell by watching them. And, and I don't think it's funny at all. It's, it, to me, it's sad. Just trying to avoid this statistic that no one can avoid one out of one, you see. And it's so unnecessary, this angst, this worry, this anxiety. Listen to the word of God again this morning, what it says here. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. And you might say, oh, but preacher, you said Revelation was full of figurative language, and this is maybe one of those parts we shouldn't take so word for word. Well, possibly, but it sounds awfully literal, doesn't it? I mean... When John writes verses 12 and 13, there's no red dragon there breathing fire 
and there's no many-headed beast emerging from the waters. It's just plain language. Yes, it's surrounded by figures in chapter 14. We read some of them in our selection. You know, at the beginning of chapter 14, there's this number, 144,000 people in the opening verses, which seems to be a symbolic number representing all the saved. And then throughout uh, the chapter, there's all these angels flying around doing different things. And, and then one verse we read, there was the city of Babylon mentioned. Um, and, you know, Babylon, by the time of John, had been extinct for hundreds of years. So we know that's figurative. And, and indeed, there's mentioned a beast and, and an image and uh, foreheads being marked with something and then the wine of God's wrath is referred to, and, and there's fire, and there's sulfur, and, and so on. And then we have our verse, right, at, well, right after our verse, if you look on past verse 13, there's this picture of Jesus, Jesus sitting on a cloud, and he has this huge sickle, and uh, he says he's about to take that thing and harvest the earth. And then it says there's another angel who has his own sickle. And, and he's about to take a big swipe at the earth. And that swipe causes a blood river to form as deep as a large horse and about 200 miles long. So yes, there's a lot of figures, a lot of images. But right in the middle of all this spectacular stuff, you have this sort of quiet interlude, verses 12 and 13. It's almost like, you know, you go to a movie, an action movie, a big budget kind of thing, and you, you've seen those, and it's just intense the entire time. Um, it's, it's nonstop action. It's hard to keep up with uh, when, when you're watching something like that. And then it's almost as if suddenly... It gets real quiet for a moment, which it never does in movies like that, but it gets real quiet for a moment and a very reasonable, calm voice speaks out and says, here's a call for the endurance of the saints. Those that keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on, blessed indeed that they may rest from their labors for their deeds follow them. I'm convinced that one of the greatest things the average person in our world needs right now, but they don't know it, is rest. Rest from their labor. Rest from their worry. Rest from their turmoil and their anxiety. I imagine that there are many of us here this morning that would like some rest. And not just because we've been getting up at 5 a.m. to hunt turkey. But for much more complicated reasons than that. The world is running itself to death and taking too many of us along for the ride. And, and you know what this world is running from, right? It's running from its God, from its Creator, it's running from him and trying to hide from him for a multitude of reasons, all of them selfish. But it is a futile effort. It can't be done. Everyone that has ever drawn breath in this world has an appointment with the God who placed within them the breath of life. Everyone. No exceptions to that. 
One out of one does. It is appointed unto man once to die, and then comes the judgment. That is true for me, and it is true for the biggest, most virulent atheist in the world. Running from that appointment will wear you out. It is a treadmill that never stops and that, in fact, just keeps speeding up the harder you try to run. And what we all yearn for, whether we know it or not, is rest. Rest from that run. Rest from all the inevitable maladies that come from trying to avoid the one with whom we have to do. You know what the Hebrew writer said in another place? Chapter 4, verse 13 of Hebrews, he said, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. We all have an appointment with God, our Creator. Trying to ignore that, trying to avoid that, trying to deny it or run from it will wear you out and fill you with all kinds of toxins that will ruin your spirit. And so that God with whom we have an appointment sent his son into the world because he so loved the world. And he sent him to say the following to us. Come to me All who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Matthew 11, verse 28, 29. Rest. Rest for your souls. I believe it's what the world needs now. What I need. What you need. If we will indeed come to him, come to Jesus, get into Christ, then this blessing, the second and in the book of Revelation will indeed apply to us. Blessed are those who die in the Lord. The scripture describes death as our greatest enemy. In fact, it says it is the last enemy to be defeated, the last to be destroyed. Death is a curse. But God, through Christ, can change anything. Uh, He can even make a curse into a blessing. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Let's pray about it. Loving God, our Creator, We don't want to fear our meeting with you. We want it to be a joy and a time when we accept and enter into your rest. Please teach us and encourage us to turn to you and to be ready for that great appointment. Help us not to be too attached to the things of this world and to cling to it so strongly that it just wears us out. Thank you for sending Jesus in your love. 
for his death for us, for his life for us, and all he offers. We pray this morning, Father, if any among us need to make their commitment to to your son, that they will step out and do so. If any need to recommit and, and to call on your name again, we pray that they will have the courage to take that most important step. Thank you for all your blessings, especially the blessing to be able to die in the Lord. Thank you for hearing us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, we appreciate your presence again. Thank you for listening. And if you need to respond to God's offer in Christ, we give you this time. Let us stand. Let us sing.